everyone, and welcome to the Discipline Data Reporting Webinar. I am Joe Maimoni, the Director for the Center for Safer Schools here at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. I will be presenting along with Amy powell Moman, who is the State Discipline Data Coordinator in the Enterprise Data and Reporting Division. Again, welcome and thank you all for joining us. In this webinar, we will be covering an overview of the state discipline data reporting requirements that include both federal and state requirements and the 16 reportable offenses and the nine violent crimes. An overview of the procedures for the accurate reporting of discipline data. In this section, we will go over how to enter in behaviors, actions, objects, victims, transfers offered to victims in violent crimes, and how to enter in use of seclusions and restraints in PowerSchool. We will also discuss the reports that are available in PowerSchool, as well as pre-EOI data checks that we perform at the state level, the final verification of discipline data, and new guidance on the expungement of student records. We are now going to start with the state and federal requirements for reporting discipline data. Before we begin our review, we want to provide you with the link to the Discipline Data Reporting and Procedures Manual, which is the authoritative source for the requirements and reporting procedures. This manual is published annually and is updated on a regular basis to, to provide you with guidance for data collection and entry. This is also an additional link to the 16 reportable offenses and their definitions. These definitions are in the manual, but we wanted to show you where you can also find them on the website. Follow this link in the slide. You will find yourself at this page on the NCDPI website, which covers discipline, alternative learning programs and schools, and dropout data and reporting. Once you are here, scroll toward the middle of the page and you will see a section on the discipline collection process. Here you find the embedded link for the discipline data reporting procedures. This link will take you to the most recent data manual. You can download this as a PDF and use it as reference. However, keep in mind that we do update the manual at least once a year. I wouldn't bookmark it. I wouldn't bookmark this specifically as the link will change whenever the manual is updated. We do send any updates to the manual to whoever is listed as the district level discipline data coordinator every time there is an update. So please make sure that we have your most up to date contact information, which we will talk about later in the webinar. If we follow the second link on the previous slide, it will again take you to the main page on the NCDPI website for discipline, alternative learning programs and schools, and dropout data. If you look to the right, you will see a link to the 16 reportable offenses. Clicking the link will take you here. It goes into detail about the 16 reportable offenses. Again, this, is inform this information is also available in the manual but we wanted you to be aware that it is also available on the website. Federal and state laws require that all schools and districts report the following. Any of the 16 reportable crimes committed on a school campus or in connection with a school function, other specified behaviors regardless of consequences assigned, any action resulting in corporal punishment, in-school suspension, out of school suspension or expulsion, any assignment of a student to an alternative school or alternative learning program, victims of dangerous crimes and harassment, whether a transfer was offered to a victim of one of the nine dangerous acts, any reports to law enforcement and any school related arrests, and finally, any use of seclusion or restraint by school staff, use state impermissible designation if applicable. And new for 2020-2021, reporting data on public preschool children in North Carolina. 
in the following slides, we will go into a little more detail for each of these required data. The 16 reportable offenses are listed here. Assault resulting in serious bodily injury requiring hospitalization, assault involving use of a weapon, assault on school personnel, homicide, possession of a controlled substance, possession of a weapon, possession of a firearm, robbery with a dangerous weapon, taking indecent liberties with a minor, kidnapping, burning of a school building, bomb threat, possession of an alcoholic beverage, rape, sexual offense, and sexual assault. The prefix RO here indicates that the offense is a reportable offense. Though all of these are reportable, the offenses with the prefix PD are the nine violent crimes that are used in the des designation of persistently dangerous schools, which we will discuss in further detail later in the webinar. Along with the 16 reportable offenses, the following must be submitted to the state within five days of the occurrence. Assault as defined in general statute, the statute numbers listed in the slide, but not resulting in an injury or as severe as, as severe. Fighting or affray, again as defined in statute. Gang activity, robbery, extortion, communicating threats, threat of assault with a firearm or powerful explosive, threat of assault with a weapon, threat of assault without a weapon. Again, the general statute references are in the slide. Property damage, bullying, cyberbullying, verbal harassment, sexual harassment, har harassment due to rape, race or ethnicity, harassment due to disability, harassment due, due to sexual orientation, harassment due to religious affiliation, and discrimination is defined in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Note, please refer to the Discipline Data Reporting Procedures Manual for guidance on proper reporting of the multiple harassment codes. These are the reportable actions regardless of the offense or behavior that are required by state or federal law. In-school in suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, short-term, which are defined as suspensions that are 10 days or less, long-term suspensions, 11 days or more for the remainder of the school year or 365-day suspensions, expulsions, assignments to alternative learning programs, or ALP schools for disciplinary reasons, incidents reported to law enforcement, school-related arrests, no tolerance expulsions, and corporal punishment. Schools and districts are required to report the uses of seclusions and restraints used on students by staff. There are two separate sets of codes in power school, one for the state definitions and one for the federal definitions. The federal definitions of seclusion and restraints will likely occur more frequently in a school setting than the impermissible uses of seclusion and restraint as defined by the state. Please review Appendix D found on page 43 of the manual for a more detailed explanation. In addition, the victims of the violent offenses must be reported. Just to reiterate, the nine violent crimes are assault resulting in serious bodily injury resulting in hospitalization, assault involving use of a weapon, homicide, robbery with a dangerous weapon, taking indecent liberties with a minor, kidnapping, rape, sexual offense, and sexual assault. Schools must also report if victims were offered a transfer to another public school and whether that transfer was accepted. Also, victims of bullying and harassment must be reported. The nine violent crimes we have gone over in multiple slides can lead to a school being designated as persistently dangerous schools. Again, you see the list here. The persistently dangerous designation may be given to a school 
where there are at least two violent criminal offenses a year and a rate of at least five per 1,000 students committed in two consecutive years. When a school is flagged as potentially being persistently dangerous, the Center for Safer Schools will conduct an interview with the school to determine if the incident warrants the designation. The LEA is allowed to report to the State Board of Education on conditions in the school and any plans it may have to eliminate the conditions that contributed to the commission of the violent criminal offenses. Mm. The State Board of Education determines whether the school is a persistently dangerous school, whether the school should be placed on probation, or whether no additional interventions are necessary to protect students from violent crimes. Beginning with the 2020-2021 school year, federal laws require the collection and reporting of incidents involving disciplinary action for children ages birth through five served by LEAs and preschool programs. All suspensions in school and out of school, as well as any expulsions of preschool students must be reported via PowerSchool. The manual on page 18 has a new section that provides guidance on reporting preschool discipline. There is also a QRD, Preschool Enrollment Attendance and Discipline Reporting QRD at the website listed on the slide. Every year, the state publishes two reports related to discipline data. They are the school report card and the consolidated report to fulfill state and federal requirements. The consolidated report that is submitted to the General Assembly every year can be found using the link provided. The report includes the annual report of school crime and violence, the annual report of suspensions and expulsions, the annual report on the use of corporal punishment, the annual report on reassignments for disciplinary reasons, the annual report on alternative learning placements, and the annual report on school dropouts, on dropout rates. The school report card found at the link provided provides date on data on rates of crimes, bullying and harassment, ISS, OSS, expulsions, report to law enforcement and school related arrests at the state district and school and broken out by student groups. Discipline data is also required for federal reporting, including the CRDC, as well as a new report on preschool disciplinary data. In the previous slides, we have discussed the state and federal requirements for reporting discipline data. In the next section, we will discuss the procedures to ensure accurate reporting of data, specifically how to enter and submit discipline data into PowerSchool. For this, I'm going to turn over to Amy powell Moman. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for viewing the webinar. I am Amy powell Moman. I'm in the Enterprise Data and Reporting Division here at NCDPI, specifically in the Data Research and Federal Reporting section. And I'm the State Data Coordinator for Discipline, ALPS, and Dropout Data. What I'm going to cover in the rest of the webinar is how to enter discipline data into PowerSchool and how to actually report data, as well as how to check and verify your data using various reports within PowerSchool and then at EOY. Before I begin, I just want to remind everyone that there are specific behaviors and actions that must be reported to the state within five days of occurrence and that all data must be reported to the state by June 30th of every year. Also, the manual goes into more detail than what is provided in the webinar regarding how to accurately code behaviors and when to assign specific actions. So, for example, what is the definition of sexual harassment and how is that different from sexual assault and sexual offense? That will definitely be covered in the manual. Also, when do you report that an incident was reported to law enforcement and what exactly is a school related arrest? We're not going to go into those in detail here, but please review the manual. And if you have any questions, reach out to us. We are here to support you. So we're always open and welcoming questions that you may have. So in this next part of the webinar, I'm going to cover how to enter incidents and what is required when you're reporting an incident. Specifically, I will go over um, how to add behaviors, actions, objects, which are weapons in this case, victims, as well as how to enter seclusions and restraints. Um, after that, I will go over the different reports. 
um, available in PowerSchool as well as what we do at the state level prior to EOI to help ensure accurate reporting. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the final verification of the discipline data that occurs after EOI. The next few slides will be on how to create an incident in PowerSchool. Before I begin, though, I want to mention that these slides were created in a test instance of PowerSchool. Things might look slightly different from what you are used to seeing in your own production instance. So in the first few slides, I'm going to go over how to navigate to the incident detail page and what you will need to enter into the incident description section of the page once you're there, specifically how to indicate the incident type, which will always be discipline, um, entering the incident date, the time, selecting the time frame, um, the title of the incident, the incident description, and then the location. Now, all of these are required in order for you to be able to save your incident. So that's why I'm pointing them out here. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is log into PowerSchool, select the appropriate school and term on the start page. Once we have done that on the left hand menu under functions, you're going to see special functions and we're going to select that. So once we've selected special functions, um, it will take us to the special functions page. About halfway down the list, you'll find incident management. And we're going to click on that. All right, and this takes us to the incident management page. Um, you can use the screen to search for any incident that has already been entered um, to modify it, just to check information about it. Um, but for this purpose, we're going to select the create incident over there. You can see a little red arrow. And once we have done that, we get to the incident detail page or incident detail screen. This is where we're going to enter, update, and change any information pertaining to a particular incident. There are a few things that are absolutely required to be entered along with the incident script description information. We're going to talk about that now, but every incident must have an offender, a behavior, and an action, or you will not be able to save the incident. So the first thing we're going to do is enter the information in the incident description section. So as you can see here, I've already done that. Um, I have selected the incident type, which is discipline. Um, I entered in the incident date and time. I've selected the time frame. And in this case, that is during regular school activity. Go to Appendix A of the manual and you can see all the different options that you can select there. I've given it a title. Then I've filled out the description. I've selected the location, in this case, classroom where the incident occurred. Um, and I filled out the description. All right, so um, in this, I'm going to kind of give you, uh, we're going to have a running incident that we're working with here. So um, during this statistics class, Amy was humming and loudly drowning her fingers on her desk. She then began loudly yelling to other students, asking if they wanted to join her new band. Later, during an administrative conference with the principal, a knife was discovered in her book bag. Um, you're going to want to keep the title to be as descriptive as possible. Um, but your district, your school might have another way that you do titles, um, and that's fine. But for me, I probably should have done descriptive behavior and weapons possession or weapons possession because weapons possession is a little bit more severe than the disruptive behavior as by title. But definitely for the description, put in as much detail as possible so that you can review it later. So we've done that. We've added our um, incident uh, description and at the bottom of that page um, in the incident detail page there's another section which is the incident builder section so this is where we're going to select our um, participants we've got a search function that we can use we're going to assign that participant a role usually it'll be the offender but it could be the victim or reporter or a witness then that's also where we're going to where we're going to select um, our incident elements so the behaviors the actions the weapon objects or the weapons and then we're going to attach each of those to the actual participant. We filled out the incident description and now we have scrolled down to the next section of the incident detail page, which again is the incident builder section. And you'll see two sections here. One is for the participants and then or those involved in the incident. And then you see the incident elements. As I said earlier, every incident needs an offender, a behavior and an action associated with the offender. How to enter that is what we're going to cover here. Those two red arrows um, are pointing to green plus signs. These green plus signs are what we are going to click on to start adding information. 
The left green plus sign is going to be used to add your uh, um, offenders and victims, witnesses, reporters, as you can kind of see there in the boxes. The green plus sign um, is to add incident elements which is where we're going to add um, our actions, our behaviors, and our objects. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the green error by the participants. All right, when I did that, this window popped up. I'm going to use this to search for the participant. You can search here by last name, type, so if they're a student or if they're a staff member, the grade level, um, the context, which is the school they're enrolled in. As a default, the context will be the school you're currently under in Power School. You can use any of these to start your search. I also want to note that if one of the participants is a parent or an unknown offender, down at the bottom you'll see us create other. That is what you're going to click on to enter that the um, what is known <laughs> about that offender. Um, you must report any of the 16 reportables or any incident that involves any of the fences that are um, required, regardless of who the offender is. So if any of those um, that are required occur on school grounds, the school bus, school-related function, et cetera, it must re be reported even if the offender is a parent, uh, unknown, or a teacher or administrator. There have been situations where the incident occurred on school grounds after hours and did not involve a school a student. Um, but was still is still required to be reported. In this example, however, I'm looking for a particular student, so I typed in the last name of Powell, um, and it found these two students in Brogdon Middle, middle there. Um, in this case, Amy Powell Moman was the student I was um, searching for, so I selected her, and when I did that, the Add button um, down at the bottom became available down at the bottom of the screen became available. I want her to add her as a participant, so I'm gonna click on add. So after I clicked on add, the screen pops up. This is actually a fairly important step that based on some of the analyses that I've done um, internally is often missed. So please make sure that you select, select the appropriate attribute for the offender or the, the victim. Um, in this case, the defaults are appropriate but they aren't always. So here I needed to click on, after this, I just needed to click on add participant attributes. However, you'll need to enter in other roles other than just offender. On the top part of the slide, you can see the different roles you can select, um, reporter, victim, offender, witness. And on the bottom part or bottom half, you can see um, what we call the offender of victim types. So participant or the participant attributes. So are they teacher, staff, administrator, so forth. Um, this is where I often see discrepancies in the data. So let me show you what I mean. Another incident, I went back and added a staff member as the offender. Um, so I searched for Roz Covington, um, who was in this test instance as a staff member. Then I clicked on add, and this is what appeared in the add participant attributes. If I just accepted these roles and attributes, um, it would have made seem like Roz was a reporter. She wasn't. She was the um, actual offender and that she's a student. Again, she thought she was a staff. Um, so I definitely would have to change that. So just make sure you're looking at that or aware of that when you are entering in the different um, participant attributes. So I just wanted to point that out and make everyone aware. All right, so I've, as you can see down there under offender, I have successfully added Amy Powell moment. And now I need to add the actions and the behaviors associated with her in this incident. So what, what I'll do is go over to the incident element side of the page and click on the plus sign, plus sign there. So when I click on the plus sign, I get a new menu of add action, add object, add behavior, or add attribute action are your suspensions, um, your administrative conferences, expulsions, etc. Objects are your weapons and behaviors are what the offenders did. So I'm going to start with the behavior. I selected add behavior. This screen pops up then for the behavior code select offense types. Once um, that is selected you will get another drop down menu which lists out all of the offense types. Appendix A of the manual provides a list of all the behaviors sorted by the three digit number at the front or that you see at the beginning of each option here, but also by alphabetical order. Another thing to point out, after the number there, there's either a PD, an RO, or a UB. PD are your violent crimes. 
Um, RO are your reportable offenses. The other reportable offenses that make up the 16 reportables. The behaviors that are considered unacceptable behaviors are going to have a UB after that number. Um, these are behaviors like fighting, disrespect, skipping school. Many of the data um, entry errors I see tend to be the miscoding of a UB as a PD or an RO. So please review the definitions of the reportable offenses on the website or in the manual. Last thing before I move on, I just want to let you know you can add up to five behaviors as a rule of thumb. You will need to put the most offenses first, or we ask that you put the most severe offenses first. So as you can see, I added disruptive behavior, and it now, now appears under the incident element side, um, but it's not assigned to the offender automatically. You're going to actually need to drag that over to the offender which you can see I did here. I drug it over and now under the offender, I see disruptive behavior. For this slide, I went ahead and redid the same process to add the second behavior and side, assign that also to the student. You can see, now you can see that Amy has a disruptive behavior and a possession of weapon associated with her now. Um, but what, I, as I said two slides ago, um, as a general rule of thumb, you're gonna put like the more severe behavior first. So it should have been that I added the possession of weapon first, then I added the disruptive behavior. All right, in this slide, I just wanted to show you that you can have multiple offenders in an incident and they can have different behaviors and actions for that matter associated with them. For every behavior, you'll need to drag the behavior over to the appropriate offender. Both offenders have disruptive behavior, but you can see that Amy has the possession of weapon and Barbara uh, was, has the possession of alcohol. Now we're going to add the action type or the consequence type. That's another way you might hear me refer to it. Again, I'm going to go over to the green plus sign um, and this time I'm going to do select add action. Once I have selected add action, this screen will appear. The first thing you'll need to do is go under action code. And there are two options, action types and victim actions. For the offender, you're going to need to select action types. Once you've selected action types, um, you'll get another drop down menu. From here, you will select what action that was taken. <laughs> Again, you'll hear me say this quite a bit. You can look at Appendix A for the full list, list of actions. For this example, I selected out of school suspension. You're required to enter, for all out of school suspensions, you're required to enter the start date, the sign duration. Um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna take a few minutes to go over what you'll need to do for sus suspensions a little, in a little bit more detail. They require a little bit more information than let's say um, administrative conference with parents. All right, so <clears throat> first thing let's do is talk about um, adding descriptive information. So on the add action screen, you're going to use the action detail, action taken detail screen, um, screen to enter um, any needed details about the school's initial disciplinary action. For example, in this situation, we re recommended LTS for long-term suspension, hearing date set for um, 10, 31, 20, letter sent to parent. You're going to use the duration notes or the action change reason field to describe additional um, discipline taken by the school or action taken by the school district, particularly if the initial recorded number of suspension days are later modified. An example duration note or action change region might be hearing held um, 20 additional suspension days assigned um, beginning 10 uh, 11.06, um, letter sent to parent. All right, so here I just wanted to point out where those fields are located in the action screen. Um, you can see the action taken detail, duration notes, and action change reason. All right. So when you're reporting suspension days, um, which is the duration of the suspension, that actually is gonna determine if it's considered a short-term suspension or a long-term suspension. All right, so, for short-term and long-term suspensions, you're going to select the action type of OSS uh, for all out-of-school suspensions, except suspensions involving a district hearing, a 365-day suspension, um, and suspensions for the remainder of the year. The actual duration of the OSS will 
will determine whether that OSS is as a short-term suspension, which is one to 10, 10 days out of school, or a long-term suspension over 10 days. All right, so you can see here um, in the top picture that the OSS was for five days and had a duration code um, down there, and I kind of circled it there, um, that says short-term suspension. At the bottom of the page, there were 15 days entered, um, and you can see that the duration code is now a long-term suspension. These fields are grayed out because it's a calculated field and cannot be changed unless you change the duration code. So um, for reporting long-term suspensions, you're gonna enter the initially assigned suspension dates. You're gonna obviously route the referral form in accordance to your local procedures to ultimately capture any additional suspension days assigned by the district. If additional suspension days are assigned, you're gonna modify the action by changing the assigned duration and actual duration of the suspension. Um, I wanna show you in a moment how to modify an already assigned action. So um, when assigning a 365 day suspension, you're gonna select the OSS 365 uh, days as the action type. Um, you're gonna enter the begin date in order to capture only the suspension days that the state needs to be reported for the current year. Um, you're going to enter the number of school days remaining in the school year and then as your assigned suspension dates. Um, the system will generate the last day of school as the end date. To document when a student is eligible to return, you're actually going to overwrite this date with the correct date for the next school year that the suspension will end. So here, um, you can see that that kind of did that here. I added the it began on 10-7, um, the assigned duration and actual duration, or assigned duration was 146 days. And then that end date there is the last day of school. And then I went back and overwrote the end date to be the actual date that they will be out. All right, so this slide is just showing you that after you've um, added the actions, you'll just need to drag the actions over to the offender um, that they are assigned to exactly as you did with the behaviors. Um, I also wanted to show you here that you can have multiple actions for an offender. In this case, Amy was given an OSS as well as she was assigned to an ALP. Now, what is different from uh, behaviors is that when you assign them to a student, um, they are actually moved from the incident elements and you'll need to add them again um, for any additional offenders. And it will look like this when you've done that. So let's say you need to update the OSS days or dates or you want to go back and make a comment about the duration or you want to delete an extra behavior. To do that or to do that, what you'll need to do is put your cursor over um, in this case, I put my cursor over the action that I want to modify, which is the OSS three days. And when I did that, you'll see this little pencil icon and as well as a red bar icon. So if you click on the pencil, you can make edits to the action or behavior. If you click on the red bar, it will actually remove it from the participant. So that's one way to modify um, any of the details for this. Let's talk about adding weapons. So there are multiple behaviors that will also need a weapon associated with the offender. So those are um, assault, assault involving the use of a weapon, physical attack with a firearm or explosive device, possession of a firearm or powerful explosive, possession of a weapon excluding firearm or powerful explosive, robbery with a dangerous weapon, and robbery with a firearm or explosive devices. So to do, to add a weapon, I'm going to go back over to the little green um, plus sign on the right of the incident element and select add object. For the object code, you're going to select weapon. And then from that, you're going to see a drop down menu and you are going to select the appropriate weapon. In this case, if you remember, Amy had a knife. I selected the knife, then I drug it over to the offender. And for every weapon that the student possesses, you also need to add another possession of weapon and a weapon um, object with that. So let's say she has a knife and a leaded cane. 
that's two possessions of weapons and then two weapons associated a weapon associated with each one of those all right so both school related arrests and report to law enforcement are added as actions to the offender i just wanted to bring this to your attention there have been some confusion about how it's added how to add these two recently um, so please review the manual, though, as to when to use these two. Not all discussions or investigations with the school's SRO need to be coded as a report to law, uh, law enforcement. And for school-related arrest, the um, arrest needs to stem from an incident that occurred on the school grounds or a school-related function. If the student does something that's not related to the school, but you suspend them as a result, you'll need to capture the suspension but you do not need to capture the action um, that led to the arrest because it's not a school-related arrest. Again, the manual goes into more, more detail, so please review. All right, the next three slides will go over how to report uses um, of seclusion and restraints. As Joe mentioned, the state requires that you report to the state any adversive procedure, um, impermissible uses of physical restraints, impermissible um, mechanical restraints and impermissible seclusions. The state's definitions are different from how the federal government defines mechanical restraints, physical restraints, and seclusion. Because they have different definitions and are reported on separately, um, each of these have their own unique code inside PowerSchool. And you can see that on the slide. But the incidents that fall under the um, federal definition will not always fall under the state definition. Um, and so just a reminder that that is like that. Um, also, the offenders in these will be staff members, not students. So that's something you might want to check for at the end of the year that anytime there was a seclusion or restraint, um, it was associated with a staff member as the offender and not a student as the offender. So to report these, you'll need to create an incident in the same way we've discussed in previous slides, except here the offender is a staff member. A member. For the behavior, you'll select the appropriate be behavior. Earlier, um, we talked about behaviors having a PD, RO, or UB. You can see here that these have an SR um, after the number. Again, you'll select the offense type beside the behavior and then choose the appropriate action. For incidents of seclusion and restraint as the action, you're going to end up selecting other. Um, we are just going to capture the behavior, not if there are actions taken regarding the staff member involved. So please use other as the action. So the offense type will be, um, you know, the restraint, physical restraint, uh, but the action will be other. We are not going to capture that for the offender in, these, in this case. So, um, SPE policy requires schools to offer transfer to students of student victims of violent acts. Um, so you're going to go with the add action screen. You're going to select victim actions, and you're going to make one or two selections to attach to the victim. Uh, you'll either select that the victim was offered a transfer, it was not offered a transfer, or there was no transfer available in the LEA, depending on the circumstances. And if a transfer is offered, you're also going to select that the victim either accepted or declined the transfer offer. And then as we did with the behaviors and actions to the offenders, we're going to actually um, attach those to the victim. Okay. So in this example, I've already added the victim in the incident builder. Now I want to enter if the transfer was offered and if they accepted or declined the offer. You do this the same way you would sign an action for an offender. I clicked on the green arrow and selected action, except instead of selecting action types, I selected victim actions. And so we're gonna, in this case, we're gonna do it twice to capture the data that is needed. So first I'm gonna select if the student was offered a transfer. Um, here you can see there are five action codes, but only action code 200, 201, and 204 are the ones you'll select. I'm going to select 200. The student was offered a transfer and add that. And then I'm going to indicate if they accepted or declined the offer. I'm going to add another action that says in this case that the student declined the offer. So you can see that here. Um, I 
did decline to offer first. Um, it might be best just so that you don't forget to make sure you add both of this and these in this case to do if it was actually offered first. Then you um, enter in if they decline or accepted. The last thing I want to draw your attention to before we move on to the next section on the reports that are available is that down at the bottom of the screen here, I've circled it and put an arrow. Um, as you're entering in the data, as I said before, there are certain things that need to be entered. You will not have the option to save the incident if any of those things are missing. Here, I was happily entering away all of my information about my victim, and I went to save, and it did not let me. That's because I was missing some of the required data. And in this case, I'd forgotten to add the offender action and behavior. So as you can see, I went back in and I added that even though um, the offender is unknown, there was a the behavior was assault resulting in serious injury, and then the action was report to law enforcement. Now that I added those back in, circled down there at the bottom, you can see that now I can submit the incident. In the last almost 50 slides, we saw how we enter the data into PowerSchool. In the next few, we will discuss how to report the data to the state as well as to look at the data that has been entered and how to check for errors. I will follow that up with a short discussion on what is done at the state level in regards to checking the data that has been submitted and when that occurs. So in PowerSchool, um, there are two different types of reports. There's the state discipline report. Um, you can see it's double starred here. That's the main report. That's what you run in order to um, change and make update any changes and as well as to submit the data to the state. And then there's additional reports or discipline reports or views, which actually will give you summary and detail of the reportable crimes, um, the violent crimes, your actions transfers offered to victims, um, the impermissible uses of seclusion and restraints, and then my particular favorite, the incident detail report. And I will go over um, in detail the incident detail as well as the state report. Okay, so just remember in certain incidents must be submitted to the state within five days of occurrence but all data must be submitted by June 30th at EOY of each year. And to do that, you must run the state discipline report. Before I go any further, there is a sequence. This report needs to be run at the school level, then at the district level. And once that has been run at the district level, it will then be moved over to, to, um, to the state. So how do we do this? So from the start page, we're going to look over to the left hand menu for the report section. And under that, you're going to see state reports. Once you click on that, it will take you to the state reporting dashboard or the state report main page. And once you're here, you can see all the current collections and near the bottom, you're going to find the discipline report. The submission start and end dates are for when the report, report is officially due to the state. However, the report can be run at any time during the year. You're just not going to be able to approve it until that submission window um, at EOI. If the report has never been run before, you will not be able to see the re, uh, review button. Um, you'll just see the run button. I'm going to hit run and that will, when I hit run, that's actually going to kick up all the instances that I've entered um, as well as any changes that I've made since the last time the report was run. So you will need to run it again if you're going to make changes after that. So you will, if you make changes, if you enter new incidents, you're going to have to run that report in order for it to be put into the actual reports um, or for it to be actually kicked up to the state. So beside the discipline report there, um, you'll see a little icon that tells you it's running. Um, it does take a while, but if it takes longer than you expect, go over, go up to the right hand side and you hit the refresh a few times until it finishes. And once it finishes, we're going to go over and check the data by hitting review. And that will take us to the different reports. Now we're on the page. As you can see, there is a drop down menu for the category, report category or the type of report you want to view, then there's also um, a choose data view, or and that's the actual report. I'm going to choose discipline views or the first one there. Um, the exceptions are errors that have been thrown when the report was generated. So for 
that is something that you definitely want to check. But for right now, I'm just going to select the discipline views. And under data view, here are all of the reports I mentioned earlier. You've got the reportable crime summary, which will list out all the reportable offenses and the totals at the school level. This report uses abbreviations such as AR for assault, assault resulting in serious injury, PF for possession of firearm, and so forth. I have recently added um, the list of these abbreviations to Appendix A in the manual, so please go out there and review. Um, so the reportable crime detail will actually give you detail of all the offenders involved um, with those uh, reportable offenses. Uh, the reportable action summary, this is, you know, just a summary of the number of short-term, long-term expulsions, etc. Um, it gives you the, the reportable action detail, will give you a list of all the offenders involved, re involved with the reportable actions, the um, impermissible uses of seclusion and restraints, again, are just going to give you summary numbers. Um, the impermissible uses of seclusion and restraint detail will give you the incident number and if um, if it was flagged as aversive, uh, physical restraint, mechanical restraint, or seclusion. The transfer offer summary, again, is school level, just total number. The um, detail for transfers offer detail is going to give you the offender, incident, and offender numbers and then the violent crime summary is the same as the reportable crime summary but only is going to list out those nine violent crimes and then the incident detail okay so i've selected incident detail report here this is my favorite of all the discipline reports and this is a version of this is actually what is used at the state level to calculate the total number of crimes suspensions enrollment into ALPSs for disciplinary reasons, um, ISS, all of it. That's what we use. It is something that you can use to use do your own analyses. And then I actually have created a spreadsheet. If anyone is ever interested that you might want to use, that you would pull this incident detail report down, drop it into the spreadsheet, and it will give you summaries that you would see in the consolidated report, like you would see in the consolidated report or um, the school report card, and you could do it at any time during the year. So if you're interested, reach out to me. We can set something up so I can show you that. But so um, this is also where you're going to get all the offender demographics. You get some victim def uh, victim def demographics, but you could do subgroup analysis with this report. Um, you could do a lot of different type of analyses. So I just wanted to definitely kind of walk you through this, show you what's there so that you could have it and use it. So not only will it have, you know, the district level, it's going to have the LEA, um, it'll have all the LEA de de data and all the school data associated with it. For this one, it's just one school, so it just has all the incidents for that school, but it gives you incident date, so you could even do analyses on when certain incidents are most likely to occur. All that stuff is here. Um, it lists out all of the five behaviors that you could have added. It lists out the three different weapons, um, all of the five be actions that you could have added for an incident. And then it actually here gives you kind of a column counters. Um, so, you can filter on this here. So like beside ISS, which is in school suspension, you could go to the filter. And if you see a one, it's just zeros and one. That means for that offender in that incident, they were also given an ISS. So if you go over in ALP, you see a one if that offender in that incident was also um, given and enrolled in an ALP for disciplinary reasons for that incident. Same with STSS short term. Um, it would be a one there if they had a long term uh, 365 remainder of the school year um, expulsion. And also, if it also has the number of days, OSS days. So you could do averaging, you could look at the average number of days by pulling down the incident detail report. Um, so here I did a filter. So I was looking at the number of I was looking at all the incidents that actually were assigned to an ALP as their action. I got one. 
Um, if you don't like this, if you want to export it out so that you could use another program to run your own analyses, there is an export button that you can, in fact, export the incident detail report. All right, so there um, are other reports available in PowerSchool. You would go um, back out to the report um, start page, go under reports, state reports, and um, you would go instead of here, you can see that I went back out to state reports. Uh, instead of the state reporting dashboard, I clicked on the SQL report fives and it and then I expanded under incident here and here are all the other different reports that you can look at. So that's something that's also available to you when you are doing um, your checks and looking at your data. So um, we have actually concluded all that we're going to cover on how to enter in discipline data um, and then how to run the various reports in PowerSchool. Just remember that all data must be submitted to the state by June 30th of each year, and it's done through the state reports. Um, after you run the data and check that the data is accurate, you're going to need to approve the report by June 30th. Because there's quite a bit of data, um, the state in the weeks prior to EO, EOI also runs um, edit checks on the data looking for common errors or things that might have been missed, or if there was some type of error that has occurred in the transfer up to the state. And these are called pre-EOI edit checks. Um, it's actually a new process that we've started two years ago. But what we do is around June 1, and I can do this prior if, if you're interested, just reach out. We can always run it before June 1, um, is that we'll run the state level report. And then um, I'll actually pull out what we found, put out what we found into the EMFDS home-based home site in a spreadsheet that lets you um, districts and PSUs see what we're seeing. So what the first thing we do is we look to see if data has actually been submitted to the state for each school and district. We produce a list that says this is the number of discipline records that we have up to this point for the school and for the district. And it's just a way to check if the um, school has recently run their state report. Not all schools will have discipline, but if it's a large high school and there's only 50 records, then it's just something to look at. Another thing we do um, is we check to see if incidents involving weapons have weapons associated with it. We look to see if there are victims associated with the violent crimes and if there's a transfer data on that. Um, we look to see if the reportable offenses are coded um, as a report to law enforcement. There's not all; These are not always reported to law enforcement but it is something to check. And then finally, we will produce summary tables for the reported reportable offenses, your in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, report to law enforcement, harassment, bullying, school-related arrests. And we provide that in a format that will be displayed in the consolidated report that goes to the General Assembly, as well as in the format that you're going to see in the school report card. We typically send that out at least three times before EOI so that you can make sure um, that the data is accurate as possible, but also that any date edits or changes that have been made are being reflected um, appropriately in the state's data. We also do another round um, of data verification following EOI. This is called the final data verif final discipline data verification. Since we've started doing the pre-EOI, less have actually been submitting their final verification. We really would like for everyone to do this with the final verification. Um, it is the numbers that are submitted as of June 30th, but it's just one last time to review the data because as the data, as this, what we give you in the final verification is what will go into the consolidated report and what will be display, displayed in the school report card. Again, we send this out as a spreadsheet and we ask that it's signed and returned to us. Um, district data coordinators, this is sent out around the end of July and the beginning of August, so please look for it. District data coordinators that are out there viewing this webinar, please make sure that you have updated your contact information so that we can get that to you, as well as any updates to the manual or procedures throughout the year. Um, please email me at the email on the page there and I will send you the link to update your information. So there are 
are also additional resources available to you on the NCDPI website. There's a QDR on entering incident um, that in this link here will take you to um, that. There is also a recorded refresher um, that you can view. So if you are, if you go to the D NCDPI website and then you navigate to the NC SIS research page and you can see the navigation right there, home educators, home base, um, power school SIS, and then SIS resources, you'll find um, the DPI power school documents. You'll scroll down to you see the student information section. You will we'll, sort of accordion, so you just drop that down. And from there, you will find the QDR on entering um, discipline. I just want to say that I will be um, updating this QDR soon. Um, so if you look over right now, it's pretty much the same. It's just not a little bit older version of PowerSchool. If you look over to the right, um, if you, you'll see there's also the recorded refresher. Um, these are any recorded refreshers that you're going to be able to find. Um, this, this webinar will be there, but also if you want to know about how to enter ALP data or ALP roster, roster data um, or dropout data, you can find those there. Okay, so now I am going to turn this back over to Joe Mamoni. Um, from the Center of Safer Schools. But before I do, I just want to say thank you all for viewing the webinar. The last topic we are going to cover today is the expungement of student records. Recently, we have gotten a few questions on what that means and how to do it. There is now a section on it in the manual, so please review that. But we also wanted to go over it in the webinar since it is relatively new guidance. In accordance with statute, General Statute 115C-402, the local superintendent or the local superintendent's designee must expunge the notice of long-term suspension or expulsion from a student's official record if the local superintendent or local superintendent's designee determines the requirements under 115C-402B have been met. When a district expunges the notice of long-term suspension or expulsion from a student's official record, the, dis the district must notify the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. NCDPI will then remove the student's identifying data from the state's data. NCDPI will not, however, remove the incident or the long-term suspension or expulsion. Rather, DPI will remove the student's identifying information from the incident. As a result, the district must provide at a minimum the following information to NCDPI. The school year in which the incident occurred, the long-term suspension or expulsion that occurred, the incident number, and the student's unique identifier. You may locate the NC General Statute 115C-402 at the link provided in the slide. This concludes the webinar. We thank you all for watching and thank you all for all that you are doing for our students here in North Carolina. If you have additional questions, you may contact me, Joe Maimoni, at joe.maimoni at dpi.nc.gov. Thank you.